Hey, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm very honored and privileged to have two wonderful uh, English gentlemen with me here. Mr. Graham Coxon and Mr. Thomas or Tom Gray. Hello. Hi. How are you gentlemen? We are wonderful on this very windy and sunny and rainy British day. Just the right sort of weather. <laughs> yeah, very British weather today. Are, are we going to be so typically English that we can talk about the weather? Well, yeah, <laughs> you can, yeah. So pea what is it? Pea, pea, pea soup, pea super. A pea super? <laughs> it's not pea super at all. all so. the, you have to I really miss all those terminology. No, no, we don't do that in America. Nobody does the drizzle or the... <laughs> Squall. There's no drizzle. No, it's, it's, it's a fairly typical, but very green and beautiful resplendent spring day. Where'd you grow up, Graham? Well, I was born in um, Derbyshire. But I didn't know in much Berkshire. about what was happening in Derbyshire. Yeah, Spondon, Derby. I uh, basically Essex, I, uh, Colchester and Essex. And then when I was nineteen, moved to London. Went to art school, Goldsmiths University. You went to Goldsmiths. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was in the first year, and Damien Hurst and Sam Taylor Wood. They were in the second and third years. I didn't. I I went to Basingstoke Tech. Did my foundation in art there. I oh, brilliant. And. Uh, Year above me was Liz Hurley. Oh, right, right. And I remember Liz had like uh, frizzy blonde hair and a nose ring. That's yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it's it good. I mean, I, 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 mean I, I, I know that, that you, you, you're from that sort of, um, the art is in your family, isn't it? Yeah, all my, all my family are artists of some description. Yeah. Although my brother's an ex soldier. Oh, right, because my dad was an ex. Ba um, bandsman in the army. He was a bandsman in the army. And that's why I was sort of born in Germany. and was in Colchester, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My, my upbringing was, was, was totally, totally music. Beatles, my Bible is the Beatles. I mean, I, I didn't really have much of a choice. So there was a, a smattering of Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, loads of Beethoven and loads more Beatles. That, that, was, that was basically it. Sounds That's rather good. wonderful. I have yeah. tons of Beethoven as well. I, yeah. it, it's interesting, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of pop music that can bring me to tears, yeah. but Beethoven can bring me to tears in five seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge classical music um, fan. I mean, that just developed, I developed that on my on my own, like like my jazz thing that I like, it's really, into, and my art training and my art, that was all independent of my, of my parents, really, um, who were quite traditional and didn't know much about about art and everything like that. So the jazz and the classical music I like, it's probably a bit, my dad probably wouldn't like it, but he got me on the road, you know what I mean? Um, via Duke Callington, I got into Paul Gonsalves, this amazing tenor saxophone player, which is going into the bebop realms. And then I, I the only instrument I've ever been taught is, a, is the alto sax. So I got really oh, it's amazing. into, yeah, so I got into bebop and, um, but Ornette Coleman blew my mind and Jackie McLean and all these yeah. bebop, free jazz sort of people. So that's, and the singing thing, singing through an instrument. I mean, that's, that's sort of, so in, in, in saxophone for me is jazz. I don't take guitar anywhere near jazz. <laughs> it's a weird de <laughs> decompartmentalization of, of of stuff, it's, it's, it's kind of a strange one. So saxophone, jazz, this, uh, you know, you know, pop music, rock music. Uh, I'm not very good at jazzy things on, on the guitar at all. Um, it's far too complicated. And, and, and because, um, although, although I did GCSEs and all those sorts of exams at the end of, at the end of school, I, I did sort of performance versions of the O-levels they were called then, GCSEs, the exams that, you know, we have over here. And um, um, but never really got really heftily into doing the theory, theoretical mm. side of it because I always approached it like um, I mean I listen to the Beatles and I and 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 this kind of um, double double stopping. You can turn up, dude. I, I I really like that sort of, and I realised so much how much George Harrison influenced me with, with, with stuff like that. Um, but I was into Sid Barrett and Pink Floyd and Gong and Robert Wyatt. The Gong people. and Robert Wyatt. I, I love it. I, I love Gong and I, and I loved Caravan. I, I was in Colchester. Caravan space. in the land of grey and pink. Yeah, it's a, it's a lovely golf album. Girls stop to think. A lovely album, yeah. And, oh. Um, but that was it. And there was a load, loads of hippie bands, I suppose, squat bands in Colchester that you would just improvise sure. for hours and hours. And I yep. was sitting. I had the same, same upbringing. 
There's a guy who's going to watch this called Ulrich. I suppose he was my roommate who I he used to squat, and I used to go over and do all these squat jams. Yeah. Like at 15 years old, my parents even knew what I was doing. And do the same thing, just jam for hours and hours and hours, like on A minor grooves. It was brilliant, and I, lo and I love the gold stuff, love psychedelic music, and, and the garage punk music, the old 60s beat music coming from the Beatles and the Kinks, of course. I always felt like that Park Life was kind of like OK Computer, but the great album for me was Modern Life is Rubbish, like the mm. Benz is the great album. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I remember all of me, all of my friends that were all in bands. When Modern Life is Rubbish came out, that was like, that to us felt like the most obviously 60s influence, you know, was really kind of cutting edge. And then Park Life was like, everybody discovered you in a big time, like a year later, like, oh, in the same way, like yeah. in America, OK Computer, they all worship OK Computer. It's because they didn't get the Benz. Mm. When everybody, when we were in England, the Benz came out and we were like, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is like that. Because I always think Modern Life is Rubbish was a minor station going to sort of the St Pancras, which is Park Life or something. But there was a lot yeah. of transformation. There was a lot of stuff going between maybe using a little bit of the Manchester indie dub dance, skippity scoppity beat sort of thing, where yeah. we finally decided to stop all that and just play how we wanted to play without thinking we should put a, a drum loop underneath anything or something like that. But also there's a couple of things, like there's a song called Resigned, which was something that we had recorded on a mammoth session we had there at the Matrix Studios in off Coptic Street, as well, off uh, New, New Oxford Street. It was a great little studio downstairs next to Pizza Express, so uh, lots of pizza. <laughs> and um, there was a song called Oily Water, Resigned, and they were all just recorded with our friend and engineer who we met at Matrix called John Smith, who was fantastic, and Miss America. He recorded all sorts of great songs. And that guy's a genius engineer. We need to find what he's doing now. John, yeah, and he had a Public Image Limited tattoo, which was pretty cool. He had a pill tattoo? Yeah. Wow. The classic nice. kind of round yeah, black yeah. and white logo, for want of a better term. But yeah, lovely, lovely. Um, just, just we were just, Genius. we were just allowed to do what we wanted, and and and, and so I, I do get slightly upset when people are like part live song two because uh, um, I, I I see it as the high street of Blur where these singles, you know, yeah. um, song two and there's part live blah, blah blah. But round the back, there's a lot more, there's a lot more interesting stuff that we used to mess around with. We weren't afraid of, of of being uncool really and doing really silly things and just just to, just to try it. And see how it would how it would go so uh, oily water and and resigned which i think is a lovely thing um you know we were sort of a mi mixing a weird teardrop explode sid barrett sort of wire yeah. cacophony and, and and alex was wanted to be in duran he wanted to be john taylor and i remember I, yeah you know and it's all like <laughs> yeah. what, being groovy and i was always trying to chop against him you know being contrary to trying to be contrary to his groove and so that's sort of like things like girls and boys that's how that sort of came about yeah. from being a contrary guitar player who didn't want to be with a bass player who wanted to be in Duran Duran well it's well. like I, I don't want to sound like a, a you know a broken record but I what I love about bands Real bands is where every player brings a lot of individuality. What I, the, record, the bands that I don't like tend to all sound like one functional thing. We're all just playing this, and there's no like can't work off each other. If somebody brings in an idea which is completely angular to your thing, but sparks off something else, and that's when the true creativity like is is spawned. Absolutely, yeah. Because I mean, talking about Alex, I think he's one of the most underrated bass players ever. You know, his lines are superb, and and I mean, I could have put I put some guy guide bass lines down or something like that to Blur's last album, The Magic Whip, and then said, come on, Alex, come in and get the bass lines on. And it completely changes. You know, he'll do these odd random little things that are very, very Alex James. And um, then we go, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's kind of what he does. He, he doesn't like to keep, keep still an awful lot and he will start moving about. And sometimes it's, he'll get, oh my gosh, you know, that's too fast. And um, at other times he'll do something that's just, just you know, sublime, a sublime little feel or something like that. So, yeah, the, definitely in Blur, the four personalities were just 
totally in the four different corners of the boxing ring. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's what makes great bands and great music, definitely. And uh, how do we? It's a philosophical question. How do we? How do we encourage that? Because I, I feel like with all of this incredible technology we have, and I'm probably just as guilty because I have a YouTube channel. So I'm probably what I'm about to talk about. I'm probably part of the problem. <laughs> How do we encourage individuality like that? Because now there's so much. I don't know the answer. I'm, 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 I'd love to sort of think about it. But it used to be the limitations of what what sort of uh, um, encouraged creativity. Because the only way that you and I, as kids, could learn a song was to put it on a, a on a record player. If we had an old record player that played at 16, played at half speed, and figure it out. Now I can go and learn something in minutes. Luckily, because of YouTube, with the 15 different versions of it, I can probably get an exact replication. But my naive, not very good version of the somebody's song created something unique for me and I brought my own individuality. How do, we, how do we go back to that or how do we, how do we help that? I don't know. So no, it is, it is tricky, yeah. especially because it's so easy just to record track after track after track on your own. You, you, you probably get stuck in a bit of a one-dimensional block of one person's personality. I mean, that's what I always thought um, about my solo stuff, that there's a bit too much of my flavour in it because it's just one person that you need different. And I, I mm. guess it's just trying to do that thing when people were locked in grubby rehearsal rooms and they're, they're right. sort of working out the songs and trying to... I think if you're in a band, actually in a band of co-creative people and you do the things that bands do... You chip in rehearsal money and you get to the to grotty place and you're together and you drive miles to gigs that aren't very good and you're disappointed. And then, you know, I think that is what creates feelings within bands, you know, between people. It's those things. And the camaraderie. I think, yeah, and camaraderie and kind of like you want each other up in a certain way, but that comes out well. And I remember I was in a, in a band that was like a live hip hop thing. So we had a drummer, live drummer, and a live bass player, and me on guitar. But I used loads of effects pedals and like Roland VG8 systems, and it was all keyboardy weird noises and stuff. And a live tabla player, and uh, this this rapper guy, and even things like the rap. Our singer would always be late, you know. So lots of our songs started with a drum, you know, the drums and the bass, or, because that that's what happened at our band. Because Jack, you know, the, the guy was always late, or. You know, I'd get a new box, a new toy that made some awesome noise, and that was it. So, it, it, and I think that's where, it, and then obviously, when you're, you're in a band with four people, they've all got their own influences, they bring them together. And so, you get in together into a room. And like, I remember we, when we did some recording, you know, we did the classic thing where everyone brings a few albums in that they want our recordings to sound a bit like. And our bass player was super into jazz and, like, you know, bass players, he'd love funk and jazz and all that kind of stuff. And I brought in lots of, loud guitar records and the drama like lots of world yeah so and that's what you don't get sat on your own in front of garage that's what you need isn't yeah it? there's none of that you just sit there with all of your like you said all of your influences and your taste and you pick the same kind of drum loops and the same kind of that and yeah, yeah. and you get no one says well, that's shit oh that's not very good you know and change that and i think that's what's missing now and live music venues have disappeared so the the kind of the willingness and the point of, I think that there's more point in being in a project on your own and releasing it on YouTube or releasing it straight to Spotify. What's the point of being in a band? You're not going to sell any records, yeah. you're not making any money, no one's going to come to your gigs. Well, it really is about hanging out with friends specifically to make music, isn't mm. it? I mean, that's what we did. I, I, I didn't know much about what Alex liked. I know he liked a bit of Joy Division and New Order. I didn't know he wanted to be John, um, John Taylor mm. when we got in a room together. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, okay. You know, and, and, you probably kept that on the DL. Yeah. yeah I'm cool. I'm oh, Joy yeah, Division, exactly. New Order. Exactly. <laughs> and then I, I went I went back quite a way with Dave, drummer, playing in, in bands in Colchester. Like, like I sort of explained there was sort of sort of squatty punk, but, but quite, but quite, quite witty you know a sort of um mohair and sort of floppy mohawk haircuts a lot of a lot of that i, I didn't really i was covered in terps and paint 
most of the time. <laughs> so you've got to be Jack in there, So there's a lot of crazy and diverse personalities, but I think the main thing is is, is being friends and wanting to do something yeah. together, being a gang and, mm. and you're creative and you feel the need to express yourself and you, you learn an instrument. I yeah. mean, I'm, I think when Blur started, I hadn't really been playing for that long, really. Mm. I didn't really know what I was what I was doing, but I was into dynamics. I was into changes and structure. That's That was always the fun thing for me. Um, how does the, the verse differ from the chorus? Why? Because, you know, and the, the crudest example is that I just stick a distortion pedal on in the chorus and then <laughs> take it off in the <laughs> verse. So there was some sort of dynamic. But, uh, you know, obviously after that, my, the pedals grow and grow and, and, and grow. But so long as you're, you're friends... And everyone will bring their own influences and experiences. And um, I mean, you, I mean, your brain obviously, and our, our brains. I don't know what. There's so much up there, then it will just come out when when needed. And it might be a sort of a Van de Graaff generator, Peter Hamill, or it might be very. It might be a, a Beatles singer. It might be a Robert Fripp. It might be a King Crimson thing, or you, you know. Um, so there's there's a lot that's just stored up in there, and they're just waiting in 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 line. To be to be sort of used <laughs> on some on, on something and, and you know yeah, the the store of riffs. Mm. But listening to you talk, I've sat with you and we talked about influences before. But you have probably got way more fields of influence than most people who pick up and play rock guitar. I mean, all that jazz stuff and actually playing a saxophone. And I think oh, yeah. I. I think that's pretty clear in your playing and in, in the way you think about stuff. Like, you know, I don't think many guitar players sit with a turn on a rap fuzz pedal and think about somewhere between Van de Graaff Generator, you know, Pretty Things and Ornette Coleman. I and mean, that's, pre that's pretty, that's, yeah, all, yeah. that's a huge, huge, varied But it's just selection. loving music. And I think loving music... I agree. I, 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 will, music I will say, you know... It is a common thread. I interviewed Billy Sheehan, who's like a shredding rock bass player. And we suddenly get into the fact that he loves late 60s and early 70s British progressive rock. He knew all the same references, whether it be Van de Graaff, Generator, Caravan, Camel, you name it, he knew them all. He knew Henry Cow. I mean, who knows Henry Cow? No, I don't know. The Billy is uh, Nas nice. National Health, do you know National Health? No, I don't. Oh, we look up Henry Cow, look up National Health. It's like more of those kind of Canterbury bands. As soon as you get into like the Canterbury scene and you look at like the obvious Genesis, you know, and Robert Wyatt, you know, Soft Machine, there's like little fractions that go off. Yeah. And you've got the Caravans and the Camels and the Cans and Henry Cow. Yeah, and, and, Fun yeah. and the German stuff, the Faust. Yeah, the German you know, stuff that kind of gets mixed Kevin, in with the Glastonbury Fair Kevin. records and all that stuff. I mean, I'm a huge Kevin Ayers fan. And that, yeah, like Kev that's, amazing. That's yeah. That's four albums, right? Just... Absolutely. Oh wow! Love them. So it's all it, it all goes in, you know, with a sixteen-year-old Mike Oldfield uh, yeah. playing playing the bass and all the lead guitar parts. It's, it's it's just ridiculous. And I guess it's, it's insane. Sort of, yeah, yeah. And um, um, just down the road, where I think he he said he was splitting that band up, didn't he? Kevin Ayers said to to Mike Oldfield, "I'm splitting this band up." And and Mike Oldfield said, "Can I borrow your for you know, your, your 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 keyboard and your recorder?" And went up in the attic and um, demo tubular bells up in the attic, basically just down there. I, think. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that story's there's a few different versions of yeah. that story, but it, I think it was when Kevin Ayers disbanded the whole world, disbanded the whole world. Yeah, amazing. yeah, love all that, but uh, I suppose. It's a, it's a passion for music and uh, a love for it. And I mean, I don't know any other way to be in life. You know, that's how I am. And I really don't understand anybody mm -hmm. who, who doesn't have a passion. I mean, I, 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 I can see how doing without music or having no passion whatsoever about music. You know, you, you, it's, all, it's about something else. But, mm -hmm. but for me, it was, uh, I don't know any other way of, 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 of sort of being alive, but but having that, but loving music and listening to so much and soaking it up, and um, so it's always it's just it's just that it's just there, isn't it? And um, yeah, it's the it's the only thing I I'm good at. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as I always say, just ask my wife. I always say. <laughs> it's the only thing I'm good at. Just ask my wife. <laughs> yeah, but you you can play. I mean, I know that you've 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 said that you were a guitar a, a guitar player that really wanted to work out all that stuff, and you did scales and and, and, and all of that, the rest of it. And I always feel bad now. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't jam and do all that shredding. I'd be absolute. I'd look like a fool, you know. Mm. I'd be like, oh my god. But um, I, I suppose. 
I'm a sort of, um, I've always, my job has always been to interpret a melody, lyrics within the chord sequence and, and try and come up with parts that will enhance it emotionally, I suppose. That's what always my, my job has been. So I sort of custom build guitar parts for a song, you know. It's, mm. <laughs> it's not like I could just go, like, you know, I couldn't make it sound terrible. There's one thing which, like, as a learned musician, I think a lot of people assume that, okay, well, you've learned all your scales, so you are going to play a million notes. You're going to, you know, you're going to try and do your best John Coltrane impression. The flip side of that for me was, mentioning that old band I was in, when we used to come up with songs, we used to jam and stuff. So the drum would play a drum beat, and our DJ would often find cool little Indian riffs, and it had a really multicultural kind of sound. Mao Yamada, our bass player, amazing musician, still playing all the time now. He'd play a riff that had two notes in it. Like, let's say, it might, it might have had like a, I don't know, a G and a C or something. Or a G and a B flat, or whatever. And so I thought, okay, well, if it's got a G and a B flat in it, it could be in F major, you know? It could be in B flat, it could be in G minor, it could be in C, it could be, make, it get, I wouldn't play loads of notes, but I'd play three or four notes and see what that sounded like over those two notes. And then I, I choose, I think, okay, well, that's, that's got this kind of sound, so I'll try giving it a D minor kind of feel as well. So you play some D minor stuff. And I'd go through that kind of process, and then one of them would be great, and it would fit with the Indian sample, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I have often found that my knowledge of music theory and harmony and stuff, and the voice leading and chords and stuff, can often shake me in so i'll do something which my fingers have or my brain has led me to but then hopefully anyway your fingers and your kind of soul your music take over but i think i would have struggled just for me i think i would have struggled to come up with lots of options if i hadn't had like a palette of op of choices that yeah, i yeah. could think of you know what i mean yeah so i, I think i agree i mean I, I come from the same place but i think uh, i think all guitar players, I think we're all we're all jealous of Jeff Beck because we know that he really just knows like first position blues scale, but when he plays music, it doesn't ever sound just like that. I'm I'm totally envious of him because I feel like he just picks up guitar, plays a note, and then goes, oh, I need to move up higher to do. That. It's just all about ear and feel when I hear him play. That's what I'm completely envious of the way Jeff Beck plays because I just know. He's, t he's treating a guitar like a noise-making machine as well as a melody-making machine, and it just comes from a different place. To like Ornette Coleman or, you know, because I like jazz guitar playing, don't get me wrong. I do like it, but a lot of the time it sounds so interchangeable depending on who the jazz guitarist is. And there might be subtle differences. It's like, it's like the differences between, you know, the 15 different versions of dubstep or trap versus this or metal, all these different... Genres, I, I, I can appreciate the subtleties within genres, but when I hear Jeff Beck, he's his own genre. When I hear Brian May, they're their own genre. When I hear Keith Moon playing drums, he's his own genre. When I hear Bonham playing drums, uh, you know what I mean? It's like I, I, I love guys that you know, they just sort of like, I don't know, I don't know the best way to describe it. They just came at it like, in the same way, to be honest, the way Graham's explaining it, like, hearing all these different influences, bringing them all in, and then just doing whatever worked. And I'm very envious of those guys. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. all of those people were, were in it early days, you know, mm. Brian May, Keith Moon. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible to think when they started going, rock and or rock music was so young, or rock and roll even was, was still very young. You know, the, the Who were sort of a, almost like a trad jazz band to start with, you know. How young the genre was then, so how incredibly, but how incredibly original they, they were, how insane and how eccentric they were. I mean, I don't, I don't know, I get, I get such a kind of, when you were talking about Brian May with Night at the, Night at the Opera was, was, you know, that was another album I didn't have much choice about. It was 1975, my dad bought it. The same with Ian. My dad bought me that for Christmas in 1975. Yeah, I mean, that, it, it, there it was, and it reminds me of Ilex Close, where I lived, you know. That's all I listened to, the prophet song and all that echo, the voices in oh, the yeah. middle section. And listen the, to the wise man. Yeah, and then dun -dun. just after that. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Yeah, I was just, my mind totally blown. 
And yeah. um, Living Thing by ELO is another one. Yeah, um, it's a big one for me as well. B-side of Living Thing, um, Fire on High, is a very weird instrumental. That was The first half is like kind of a horror film soundtrack, and then it goes into big 12 strings and huge drums, and uh, yeah. it's great, great stuff. So um, they, they were sort of inventing it, weren't they? So they went yep. among these people, inventing this stuff and inventing genres, subgenres, and and also I suppose using the equipment and then pushing for the equipment to be improved. Until now, it's kind of you know I can't even believe that what I can do up up in the attic. You know, it's it's it's, mm. it's it's crazy, isn't it? I think I think one thing I'm 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 noticing that I really want to bring into production is the idea of uh, obvious performance, but when we used to make records, I'm sure your first few records, it was all live in the room and then fix it. You know, the band plays together, everything's isolated enough, and then you fix. Oh, the bass is a little behind or on top, and that was it. You know, the drums weren't edited, so the bass player, the guitar, you know, you had to play to the drummer. And I still, I really, really am pushing for that as much as possible now in production because that's what makes those records kind of unique because if the drummer's, like, you know, pushing into a chorus, it adds some excitement. Um, it's not wrong, it's what the drummer's doing. And I know that sounds really fundamentally obvious thing to say, but I don't hear it in records anymore. I hear drum correction, then bass player playing to drum correction, or, you know, I don't hear that natural push and pull that players do. And I'm wondering, I still haven't, and you guys can school me on this, I'm still not hearing records quite yet that are blending electronic elements with a full organic band. Now I'm hearing, you know, with with, with Damon's uh, band, The Gorillas, I do hear that mix of uh, electronic elements with instruments overdubbed and blended into it. But I'm I'm not yet heard like full band with electronic elements that works perfect for, perfectly for me. And maybe I'm wrong. It always feels like the a organic instruments are you know edited into a grid to fit the electronic elements. Yeah, um, I think that's true. I think that's true. I, I think the only way you can find that is when the t- when it started to exist together in the first place, maybe in the late seventies, maybe or maybe yeah. with some of the kraut rock stuff, but then maybe that's just yeah. too too experimental. <laughs> but maybe Gary but, Newman, maybe I was just about to say that when you first time you heard Cars, didn't you yeah. think that was the most alien kind of like robotic thing you've ever heard? And yeah, now you go yeah. back and listen to it, and you hear a real band. Yeah, I mean, um, our friends Electrian. But I love that it was, and, and even this. even things yeah. like Fade to Grey by Visage. Visage, yeah, yeah. Which has a beautiful um, live acoustic drum yep. kit come in halfway through with that lovely little snare drum, or at least I think it is. But as far as um, synths and rock and, yeah, because I suppose we'd approach it with, let's get the rhythm section flipping really tight and awesome on this on on a song and my sort of i'd be playing along as well but uh, um and sometimes that guitar would stay sometimes i'd replace it but at least we had we played it live and um so a lot of blur stuff we go let's just do it that way uh, yeah quite a lot of the time so, so there would be some speeding up and you'd, you'd finish a lot faster than it started and everything like that but to try and get the rhythm section absolutely brilliant in a live take and then maybe I would put a couple of guitars on the top of that that's how I suppose that's how we would we would try to yeah we would try to it's do still it. it still seems like a lot of the stuff from the mid 90s still seems like the future to me if I even when I listen to the electronic stuff purely electronic stuff or sampled stuff like Porter's Head and Massive Attack that still sounds completely fresh to me Dummy that album by Porter's Head yeah I think is a completely unique record and everything about it, I don't know where it came from. It's just, it's just like it just, some, some happens with books and films and art, you know, that album just appeared like it had just always been there. They just unearthed it, this perfect thing. It, that, that, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I don't know much about them. I, mean, they're from, I know that they're, they're from Bristol and this, the band I was in, but yeah. the, we, I was in a band called The Swamis and it was this Indian kind of hip hop thing. And the singer was from Bristol. So his uh, Tricky was his cousin. Cousin, right, or yeah, friend, yeah. or good friend, or something, or it's one of those. Kind of, and um, he come and see us play and stuff. He's a really nice guy. And um, it's that whole scene, you know, that whole Portishead scene. But that record and that girl singing and those arrangements and the string samples and the drums and just, just 
incredible. Just just unbelievable. I, 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 I think, yeah, I, feel, I think it still sounds like the past, yeah, the present, and the future. Yeah. And Mezzanine by Massive Attack also. Oh, yeah, it's insane. Yeah, Massive just, Attack. Just, oh, my God, that Mezzanine record. That is the perfect marriage of technology and guitar. I would say, Graham, songs. though, with, with Girls and Boys, uh, that, that's, that's another track, though, that has no date to it. You're talking about Visage, you're talking about Gary Newman. What was the specifics? Was there, I mean, obviously, we talked about the Duran Duran bass line. Yeah, I, I suppose, I, I think we were probably listening to Chairs Missing by Wire quite a lot. There's some oh, wow. really weird, um, there's some crazy sort of dance music on that, which I don't really know how they did it. When, when there's a, a synthesizer going, you know, <laughs> doing this thing, um, and they're managing to be absolutely tight. I mean, I mean, and this was, what, 1978 or 1979. So I think Wire, what you were saying earlier, maybe it's maybe Wire is the answer. Because Pink Flag is kind of... It's kind of really sort of fuggish and artless, although it's very clever, yeah. and all the songs are tiny, very, very short. But then Chairs Missing is very sophisticated and yeah, has, very. has a lot of um, weird technology, a lot of crazy synth stuff, a lot of um, um, se sequences, plus ear-splitting hideous guitars, drum machines, and, and live drums as well. So Chairs Missing, I think, is a very important record, and, and um, that was a massive influence on... Makes a lot of sense. I, I imagine they probably have the arpeggiator going or whatever, and then the band is, is working to that, hence the reason why it feels like it lives and breathes around it. Well, Pink yeah, Floyd yeah. was on the run, didn't they? Nice. Yeah, so, I, that's, the, yeah. that's the thing. I mean, now it's a bit easier to just drop the arpeggiator in and it, and it senses the tempo and off it goes, it's mm. lovely. But them days, trying to, you know, in headphones, trying to keep with your drummer and an arpeggiator going and trying to keep in time. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly more challenge, I think, when you're playing it, doing it live. I was working with Salam Remy the other day, and he he's been he uses Ableton, and he he took the band we were working with and loaded it in, and then created the up all like synth stuff and arpeggiator stuff off the feel of the band, which is pretty awesome. Right. But you can do that in Pro Tools, can't you? You can you can use Beat Detective to cut. Well, no, this did, yeah, bands. you can definitely do that, and you can create tempo create maps in Pro Tools. But what this yeah. was doing was actually triggering sounds. It was reading. Every single tone that the guitar player was playing and creating sounds from it, which was absolutely insane. And there was a certain wrongness and randomness that created a whole different idea of a song. So would it, would it sense the guitar player and then yep. recreate the guitar so it sound, or would it just a different sound? It, no, it just would trigger new sounds. So you would, you obviously you could cue up different sounds, but it was reading it, probably using a similar algorithm to Melodyne where it sat there and found the pitch. And then it would trigger different sounds from it, and the randomness of it was just amazing. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds mad, yeah. So it was almost like um, nothing like MIDI, though, like that you could put any sound in. You could play a MIDI line, and then well, it would then it could create MIDI information afterwards. Yeah. So yeah, it could do. It was definitely. I, I'm speaking very peripherally. I'm sure there's going to be loads of people commenting about this um, that know what they're talking about because I don't. Um, but <laughs> all I know is like within a few seconds. It was the most random stuff that was coming out that was being triggered, you know, using melodies that it was finding within it. And I was just so impressed with, wow. with that because it seemed like, oh, maybe there's some future there because yeah. um, we're keeping the groove and the feel of the band, but we're triggering a whole other sounds. Yeah, that's, 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 that's amazing. But I, I like that thing about not really knowing why. I mean, it keeps your enthusiasm. If you can explain yeah. why something yeah. happens, then it's really dry and boring. It's like, well, actually, it's just happening because of... Blah, 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 blah. The NFL is really just good. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah I, that's, I, that's I, I could be wrong, but I feel like won't won't get fooled again, probably started from the the organ arpeggiator. I mean, that's what it feels like, that... Doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, gow, 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 gow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could be wrong, but... And there's all that Barbara O'Reilly thing as well. The, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So you got one of Tom's guitars there. Tom tweeted me and said, here you are, Christmas has come early. <laughs> I've made you a guitar. And I thought, it was dinner time when I saw it, and I thought, oh, that, that's a bit, oh, that's a bit crazy. And then, uh, and then you know, I had a bit of dinner, and, uh, and I thought, I've got to have a look at that guitar. And uh, so I had a little look, and I was like, hmm, Telecaster shape. Yeah, 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 very, very, yeah. I like Telecasters, because there's nothing much to get in the way. Nothing to hurt you too much when you're windmilling, you know, doing the windmill. 
And I thought, and, I, and then I love these pickups because I've got my SGs. My, I've got a sort of 68 SG special right. and with, with, with P90s. And then I've got an old Les Paul with P, a gold top Les Paul with P90s. And I just thought, this looks really interesting, this guitar. And so I said, yeah, bring it over. Tweeted him back. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. And it's, and it's light because it's hollow down these both sides. Oh, wonderful. Like a 335, you know? So it's a sort of 335 SG telly. Yeah, and it's got a slight, it's got a 25 inch scale length. So it's in between a telly, a, a telly and a 335, which I think adds to the slightly slacker strings kind of vibe to it. Yeah. Mahogany, but you're speaking, back. You're speaking my language. I, I, I um, my favourite guitar, well, my favourite guitar is actually the Rosewood Telly. I always wanted that Rosewood Telly that George Harrison played. They're actually kind of a pig to play. They weigh about six tons, <laughs> but, yeah. but they just look beautiful. Yeah. But I think a functional guitar is, is almost all of those things together. A friend of mine built one by taking a, a Les Paul scale length tele, uh, tele, Telecaster neck and putting it on a thin line body. So I think that shorter scale you're talking about really helps. It does. And it's mahogany, maple, like, like a... Like a like Beautiful. It's great. So, it's what, what, so what is it? It's a mahogany... Mahogany. Top, maple top. Mahogany back. Yeah. Maple top. And it's got this Wonderful. lovely, comfortable, recessed Ooh, that, feel. Yeah, that's nice. It's nice, which I thought, you know, why not? And the, the neck is um, finished in oil and wax, like... Um, oh, I love it. Which is great. Gives it a nice, slick Gorgeous. feel. I basically, <laughs> basically just stole all my favourite things of all the guitars I'd ever had and put them all together pretty much. Like this guitar. I think that is all the favourite things. You know, there's something satisfying about playing a hollow guitar. Yeah. Because it's that acoustic feel of it. It's got that kind of banjo-y yeah. 35 thing about it as well, which is really good. I, lo I love the way I remember when I got a 335 and there's some songs that I use it in there, always I use it try to get the fattest sound ever out of, out of them. And um, and then I'd be getting a couple of distortion pedals on, a, a rap pedal or a rap pedal and a Watson fuzz together. And um, the thing you should just go, you <laughs> should be shaking in your hand, you know. And um, I just love, love that feeling and how feedback. And I mean, I, 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 I love the idea of sometimes I'd leave the guitar to do what it wants to do. I'll pull a note and see where the guitar takes. So a lot of my approach to guitar soloing is kick it off. It's like kickstart the guitar and then put a couple of fuzz pedals on and, and see where it leads you really. Because uh, the coffee and TV guitar solo, that was, that was the first, that was a first take. That was just, Oh, there's a gap. Should I just stick a solo in? And I, I wasn't really looking at the fretboard. I was stepping on tremolo pedals on a different fuzz, and then and then that. And I was just kind of just hitting the odd thing and bending and stuff like that. And then we we said, okay, that's really silly, and, and put it. Let's go on to something else. And then I guess a week later, <laughs> we pulled up Coffee and TV, and there's this ridiculous guitar solo on it, which we'd sort of forgotten about because it was just a one take thing, just to fill a gap just to say, this is instrumental section. Mm. And I was kind of shocked at how well it sort of worked, and so it stayed. But um, yeah, so anyway. That's Kevin, a great, that's a great lesson that. for all of us, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I instinct is, that. instinct cannot be uh, overestimated. Yeah. It's you painting. know, what you instinctively do and just happen. Yeah. 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 It's just to do with painting and creating a, yeah. a for me, it's almost, it's almost yeah. like that. But it wooden knobs as well. Yeah. Wooden. Wooden knobs. Ebony, no, no Listen, less. extra sustain. Ebony. <laughs> yeah, you can feel the sustain in that moment. Yeah. My dad That's did a beautiful. wish for an Ash record where they were famous for doing solo -y harmony stuff. Yeah. yeah. And um, they were working Throw down on, the sword. They were working on a instrumental section and I think they both Either, each guitar player did did something without the other guy. So they did their take on track 17 or whatever, and then had, had a cup of tea or something. And then the other guy came and did his, you know, on track 18 of it. And then just by chance, you put them up together. Uh, just without, magic. Without right? listening to yeah, the one. Yeah, they just... They, yeah, yeah, I love that. And um, Dad's like, brilliant, just leave it. And they're both like, no, we can do it better. We can, we can do it better, couldn't we? Let's change it. And they said, no, you're <laughs> not. No. You know, and it was the end of the day. And Dad said, well, let's go home, let's go. And Dad had to say to like the engineer, the engineer, if you, if I come back tomorrow morning and those takes are gone, like you know, <laughs> you are sad, you know. And I think it made the record, but um, yeah. so those happy accidents are definitely 
I love them. I love them. Well, uh, good ears. I mean, they had a good ear. They were both playing yeah. melodic stuff yeah. that fit, put yeah. it together, and even yeah. and even when it goes into unison and comes back out, that probably even creates more tension. Yeah, yeah. That's also Heroes, isn't it? That's the Tony Visconti talking about Heroes with Fripp, that he does two Ebo tracks. They, they, they do one, they do another one, and they're like, oh, just wonder what it would sound like if we listen them together. And... Hence, you get that kind of tension where there's a minute, they're a semitone apart, and then they come back together, but it creates all that kind of like movement and stuff. Yeah, I, I like that when um, I think there's the Velvet Underground, What Goes On, the guitar solo yep. and that. Yeah. So isn't that Lou Reed having four or five goes at it and then said, oh, what do they all sound like together? I want to go back and listen to that. I never thought yeah. about that. I, li I, li I like that. I like, I, li I like extended organ outros. And what goes on has one of those. And Cirrus Minor by Pink Floyd. I'm quite an, yep. That's why I like Van de Graaff Generator. I, I, I can forgive a band to not have a guitar if they've got some good mm. organ playing. When I, when I was working in a music store, um, Kingfisher, I worked at Kingfisher and Anderton's when I was a teenager, and I was working in Kingfisher, and David Jackson came in. Oh, brilliant, yeah. The saxophone yeah. player for Van de Graaff Generator. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely bloke. A, a lovely bloke, and he came in, and I, he, he was like kind of bewildered that I knew who he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're an extraordinary band. I believe he's, he, was, uh, he was teaching uh, special needs kids music. Yeah. I think he was still doing that. When I, I met them, they played in Shepherd's Bush, Empire, and I was just, oh my gosh. You know, I, I went backstage to meet, meet them all, and Guy Evans was a fantastic guy, and, 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 and yeah. Pete Hamill, and, and Hugh Banton, and they were all great, yeah. you know, really great, and I loved the show. That meant so much to me, um, Van de Graaff Generator, around 17 or 18. A girlfriend I had when I was 17, 18, had a fantastic record. She had, Relics, all of Patti Smith stuff. She had loads of Velvet Underground, oh. all of the Van de Graaff Generator albums. You know, it was it, it was insane. She had such great records, and she got. Are we blessed? Too. The more we do this, we're sort of blessed that we we we're, we're kids and we're looking at all these records and we get older and we we keep doing this as a career and we get to meet all these people. I know. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Isn't it insane? Uh, it's like it's like so waking up every day and being fifteen again. I remember when when John Lennon died, how vivid it was. Yeah. And I bought my mum double fantasy for Christmas. So I run out and I, I you know, he dies that, that day. And I, I, and I just ripped it open and said, sorry, mum, I'm listening to this record. And then I flash forward like uh, years later and I'm living in Los Angeles and I'm making records with Jack Douglas. Yeah. Amazing. Who produced double fantasy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's like, it I don't know if that's, you know. <laughs> All my hairs are standing on end thinking about that. And there's you, you go, you go and you get to go and see Van de Graaff Generator play. Yeah, I mean, I've met pretty, I've met so many people that, that I admire, I you know, and I love drummers. I know there's an amazing rainbow. rainbow just looking at the, <laughs> we've got a panorama. You have a rainbow. Pally Pally is a massive rainbow. Perhaps I should turn the computer around briefly. Yeah. <laughs> rainbow rock, post punk, mm. punk. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I have this theory, which I, I have this theory, and, and and it's probably not fair to have this theory because it fits out yours and mine's. You're, you're younger than us, aren't you, young Tom? I, I just turned 50. Oh, well done, well done. Oh, you had that Di awesome party that I'm very jealous of. I should have been at. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I, I'll throw it every year and keep having being the same age until you catch me up. So you've got two more years. <laughs> but I think we were blessed. I, I have this theory, and I'm sorry, it also supports my age group and your age group, but I think we were blessed because there was this period of the mid-late 70s to the early 80s where it all came together. Because it was all the technology. We had these, the great tape machines like that. Studa got it, got it right. Um, there was a beginning of synths, sequencing, um, and people still cared about writing amazing songs. There was still enough of the influence of the Beatles from the 60s that it was still important that you wrote a really good song. And, because it's weird, even when you think about bands like Crimson, as, you know, they still wrote pop songs. Down, 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 down. Go, go, you know. It, that's that's still a sing-along riff. Yeah, I mean, I mean that that record in, from 1969 is must have sounded absolutely crazy as well. They've caught the Crimson King because of that weird dry drum kit sound. There's no yep. big compressed roomy drums. It's all it's all kind of really strange 
strange um, sort of sounding. Yeah, yeah, but but, but I, suppose, I just think that I golden period. period. Like I remember the first I time I heard so. teenage it was still kicks. Kind of coming yeah, from yeah. a, it was still sort of coming from a blues, wasn't it? I guess blues was still. Yeah, there. it was still yeah. the blues. Yeah. It was still in the music. Do you remember the first? I remember the first time I heard teenage kicks vividly, and just thinking. What an amazing record, The Undertones. I remember the first time I heard Sweet Dreams, when they came on the radio, the first time I ever just feeling again like, what is this alien music? You know, first time I heard um, Gary Newman. I don't know, it was all like, what a freaking awesome time. But even some of the American stuff, like The Vapors, Turning Japanese, yeah, when I first heard that, you know. It was, it was great. That's that, that, that bridge section. section. No sex, no drugs, no wine, no women, no, 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 no. Everyone around me is a cyclone ranger, everyone. It's just awesome. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really, really, really good stuff. But on the, talking to someone a bit younger than you then, I remember, <laughs> I remember when I was... I thought 15, you were older than us. When, when, I, was, established that when I was 15, ago, I was 15, <laughs> I was 15 in 1991. And in 1991, the first of Nevermind came out. From the mm. The Rage Against the Machine album came out. Blood Sugar Sex Magic came out. I think Bad Motor Finger came out by um, Soundgarden. That was an. Um, Alice in Chains Dirt came out in 92. Yeah, it's no. a great record. Yeah. And I really had. I had the feeling. Like my, my dad was, um, was born in 47. So when he was at university in Birmingham becoming a doctor, in, he was, you know, 20 in 1976, like, you know, and he'd tell me stories about, you know, listening to, you know, Jimi Hendrix for the first time. And, and I was so jealous. I, think, I just think, oh, imagine being 20 in 1976 and they told all these stories and he'd, he'd go to gigs and lig, lig till the end and meet George Harrison or whatever. He'd do all these things, you know. But then going full circle, I was... My, you know, we've got Spotify. My wife's got Spotify on her phone and she's got a little Bose dock thing, you know, in the kitchen of our house. So the kids can just wake up in the morning and they can listen to any song on planet Earth <laughs> in the dot, 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 you know. Yeah. And when um, Chris Cornell, unfortunately, you know, left us a few weeks ago, I listened to Super Unknown, my favourite album by them and I kind of thought I thought about all those amazing I saw them in 94 at the Reading Festival I did that I was there too well there we go so and I and I kind of realised I I was born in one of those things I had that thing mm. you know I had that onslaught of just incredible incredible records I guess you know I'm lucky because I I got but you know I had my dad was really into Little Feet and Jimi Hendrix and the Allman Brothers and so growing up in my house, obviously The Police was the first band that I ever remember hearing ever. There's a B-side called Landlord, three and a, two and a half minutes, super fast, wig out song. And my brother and I used to just put it on really loud in the living room and jump around the sofa and just like, you know, crit. Being ex exposed to incredible music. And then, yeah, I, at 15, 16, 17, new lot, you know. And talk, you talking about having these amazing moments about like, you know, meeting this guy for band. I am, for, I am sat with one of my obsessively crazy heroes now you know i'm sat here it's no it's know, true and i i, mean, I don't want to i don't want to underestimate you know, i know i touched upon it with modern life is rubbish but i want graham to know it's like obviously he knows a lot of the same people we, uh, i know because of matty so there was matty and i'm, I'm sure you must know jute his brother yeah. or spew you probably know him as <laughs> julian um we always called him jute or spew and he, he at the time in the mid 90s was a bbc engineer you do all the outside broadcast stuff. And Matty in 95, 94, 95, when you were talking about, was the, was the main controller of the Reading Rock Festival. He was doing all the sound there. So I remember going there in 92 when Nirvana played. I stood side of stage and Matty was freaking running the sound for the whole freaking festival. I mean, like, so we were really blessed to, like, be absorbing in this stuff. But I remember when Modern Life is Rubbish came out, it was like, it was a big deal with all of the bands in our area because it was like the first time it felt like everything kind of connected, all the dots, because we, all the music we're talking about that we love, there wasn't anything representing that. As much as Oasis were great and all this kind of stuff and all the pop bands and all the great bands were, were really, really good, it was just great that that sounded like all of the influences that we're talking about. Mm, and right. yeah, so I, I'm with you. 
It's like I don't want to blow smoke up at poor old Graham's butt here and, and be all kind of like, <laughs> but it was. It was a great, great time. And Park Life yeah. was a great, great record, and I'm glad it had that massive pop success. But for us, Modern Life is Rubbish was just... And, and how'd you get the frickin' cover? I mean, of all... <laughs> it's, it's, where did that come from? Well, it's... <laughs> It's a mallard, isn't it? I, I think mm. we were we just had this birthday card and we just and it had a train on the front and uh, we were just like, can't we just have this? And then of course we phoned up the company and said, no, you can't use that. So we hired an artist to reproduce the the, the picture of the I think it was a mallard or was the mallard? No, I think blue? so. Yeah, it's a blue one. It's the blue one. Um, to to basically oh, no 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 it's not. I mean I think no I think we were able to. Oh my gosh, I'm getting mixed up, yeah. jazz signers. But yeah, yeah, I think I think um, we we got an artist and to do the the drawing of us on the back on the train on the, on the district line. And I think he yeah. I think he did the mallard on the front as well because that we weren't allowed copyright reasons. So basically, you, what we're saying is you were steampunk before steampunk. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> you were saying modern life is rubbish, and then using a steam train. <laughs> I know. I, we, we were. I suppose we were sort of trying to be clever. And we were sort of arty background, me and Damon, and, and um, you know, we, he also did the backgrounds for the For Tomorrow. I don't know whether you've ever seen the album, the, the, the sleeve for the single For Tomorrow. Yeah. But it's a, it's a picture of a sky and the shape of a Spitfire. But you know, I'm obsessed. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a Spitfire. And first of all, we said it's a lovely Spitfire, but let's just black it out. So it's just the black silhouette of a Spitfire against the sky, and that I am three badge or something like that. So this is a spotter plane. Oh right, yeah. yeah. It's a spotter plane from World War Two. So they would they would hold that silhouette up in the sky to make sure they weren't shooting at the wrong planes. Oh my gosh, but it's or a really nice. Or make sure they were shooting at the right planes. I should say. It's not just a shape. It's a really nice model. And then this, this is uh, some trench art. This was made by. One of the mechanics for his uh, for his son, one of the Spitfire mechanics, and then this is actually a piston from a Merlin oh that was my. shot down in 1940 and dug out of uh, out of uh, a beach in 1971. So wow, that's fantastic! I'm a little obsessed with Spitfires. Sorry, that so was my what, little. I wonder what that beat would that beat have been in Kent somewhere? That beach. Yes, it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Amazing. Yeah. A friend of mine actually was a. Who's a not, not talking about guitars who's similar. If he could make guitars, it'd be insane. But he basically uh, rebuilds and, and um, builds motorbikes, monkey bikes, has, has, has rebuilt old 1950s and 60s Jaguar racing cars and all of that. Uh, recently, um, recently bought a Merlin engine, and he's going to. He did. He's going to put it in a car. <laughs> And um, do you know those the hill climbing thing? Yeah. And, uh, he's yeah. gonna. He's bought one of those. He's, he's, he's putting it in a. He's building a car. A framework, <laughs> and he's going to stick that in there. So that'd be pretty good. Imagine what he could do with the front. Yeah, bit, well, yeah. A few bits of wood and some, some fret wire. I love that. That's so insane. It's fantastic. Yeah, he's, he's totally Put a Spitfire mad. engine in a car. Yeah, he's totally <laughs> mad. I mean, it's the same technology, isn't it? So, um, well, we're going to talk about more guitars. Let's do some, let's do some guitar pedals and stuff. Let's, let's talk about, let's talk yeah, about yeah, the, the, the hot fuzz, and then let's talk about all the other stuff as well. <laughs> the hot fuzz, yeah. Hot fuzz oh, is no. around, isn't it? Look, yeah, look. Do you have a so we've got a whole load of awesome pedals here. If you play, great. I'll just what do you want me to play? I'll noodle with these. Um, bearing in mind that I can't shred. <laughs> Just looking at my input levels here. So we've got these two guys here, this sidecar and this broadcast, and made by a guy called Michael at uh, Hudson Electronics in the UK up north. And it's great. It's based on an RCA preamp, basically. So this, this is without it. Right. With it. Sounds like you're playing. Your, your guitar's been recorded in the '60s, you know, through a nice hot preamp. You know. And then the other half of it, it just kind of multiples the gain crazy. Oh yeah. A 
That's cool. Nice. This is really cool. Ooh, what's that? Nice, eh? Yeah. It's a bit like the B8, it's a bit like the Hot Fuzz, a little bit, I guess. It's, it's the broadcast, but it's the it's the, it's this side of it, yeah. yeah? two sides, yeah. So there's like two... So, two, so two what happened sides. when you put that in, because that completely went nuts? Yeah, it will do. Yeah, I guess you won't hear it, I guess, until you get this footage. But explain exactly what it is, because well, it's sort of... Yeah, it's got two sides. Um, uh, one side is a very light... It's sort of like tape saturation, isn't it? It's a bit like... Yeah, yeah. Like you've really overloaded your mic preamp in a, in a good way. And then if you step on the other side, you get kind of like just a higher gain setting. And it's all germanium, so it's all very clippy, that kind of pulling Velcro apart edges, that lovely sound. And this one, this side, there's another one called a sidecar, which is just kind of like a, a an overdrive pedal, really, but it sounds awesome. Again, germanium as well. So um, I'll give you a bit of this. Yeah, this is a- uh, This is awesome. Isn't it? So this is without, without. sidecar into the broadcast, <laughs> you get this. <laughs> oh. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Clean sounds. We do you got one of these origin effects pedals yet? No, I don't. Oh, okay. You gotta get one of these. This is their Cali 76 Compact Deluxe. Yeah. So it's, it's like a, it's an 1176 in a box, basically. And it's super nice. over-engineered, it's just ridiculous. And the cool thing about <laughs> it is it's got a dry a dry um, knob and a wet knob. So you can like like two faders on a mixing desk, you can Literally, like parallel compression, you can blend how much dry you want. Yeah, it's really, really great. Um, if I just uh, just play a bit, I'll just turn it on. So I turn the dry up. That. Oh yeah, and they've got this. Um, there's a there's a great guy based in Yorkshire called Luke Hilton, and he makes these stone deaf effects. And there's this uh, Tremotron, which I'll, we've got down here. It's the most cool, nice. beautiful looking pedal. Yeah, it really life. looks amazing. You have to check out the footage when you get it. Um, and it's it's completely analog, but it's got yep. a kind of digital brain, so it can store four presets. You can control it by MIDI, all that kind of stuff. So for you, if you're sat in the studio and you want to like, you know, you want to get, you want to sync up a delay time with a with a, you know MIDI send from Logic or whatever or Pro Tools, it's great. Um, that's a bit of this. So if you want, it does Fender. Look, it does a classic Fender. You can choose the waveform, all that kind of stuff. It's got a tap tempo too. <laughs> so a bit of a bit of the Ipcrest file. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's got all sorts of asymmetrical ones and all sorts of crazy stuff. 
Ipcrest file meets Get Carter. Yeah. Yeah. And you, can, and you can do things like you can combine two of them if you want. You can have two different... Let's do one of those. So there's two there. There's a fast one and a slow one. <laughs> You know, I've scrapped if there's so many things you can do with it, it's awesome. I gotta ask Graham as he was detuning, did you ever get into the groundhogs? Mm, no. Tony McPhee had this song, um, and he did an album called Split. Do you know this one, Tom? No. It's the one where he goes do 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 it's a great, great song. It's called Split Two, I think. And he's just, it's a, just an SG, I think. I think through a Marshall. It's just really a great again? guitar sound and it? a great part. Who was the guy you mentioned was in Groundhogs? Tony McPhee. Tony McPhee. He was the singer and the guitar player. Right, right, okay. I think he played with John Mayle for a little bit in the late 60s. Oh, was he in the Blues Breakers? I don't know if he was ever officially in the Blues Breakers, but I know there's an association. And that album, Split 2, quite successful. And I think, didn't they have an album called Thank Christ for the Bomb? <laughs> no, Which I think it was <laughs> charted. Didn't they I think, that. Yeah. Which charted. Uh... So that's awesome. I can't see all of them from my angle for a second, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Do we cover good. everything? Yeah, the Tremotron is amazing looking. Beast. It's covered in light and it's got a big sort of orange Mexican kind of skull on it. Skull. All his all his graphics right. are kind of like uh, yeah fifties kind of hot rod kind of sci-fi stuff. He makes all a lot of um, things. He makes a lot of he calls them parametric gain pedals and like they, uh, Josh Homme uses them a lot. Dave Grohl's got a bunch of them. And, Fantastic. And they're very you can kind of choose your choose it, you know, your Q value and your distinct value, your, your frequency where you really add or take away these frequencies, and they sound really amazing. Um, yeah, so um, he's doing super well, super well. So a couple, couple of things. Let's, let's plug in the hot fuzz and, and oh, mess yeah. around with that. I've got. A, you yeah. should play on that strap because that's got some trickery, hasn't it? Yeah, it's got some that trickery. Is, that is fab. Fabulous. Let's, yeah, let's do what we did before. Let's just put it on the end. Do you want to get the, do you get the strap going on with the hot fuzz? Yeah, let's do that. What amp are you guys using? Uh, Princeton Reverb. Oh, nice. My little Princeton. Little, my yeah, little Princeton. I love that thing. So I recently when got you... the, um... Sheriff. The Sheriff, the Sheriff 22. Um, you had a Victory Amps yet? Victory Amps. I have, I hear wonderful things. Yeah, they are amazing. Martin Kidd, he did all the Cornford stuff. Martin Kidd was Cornford Amps. Oh, I didn't know that. There's a guy, you know Richie Cotson? Yes. Cotson with a Z, with a T. Oh, that's even cooler. And uh, he had a he had a, a signature Cornford Amp. Then Martin went and did Victory stuff. And now so he's doing that all the time. And they've got a whole list. Yeah, stuff. I hear really great things about them. Oh yeah, they're, you know, amazing. I, I think for a lot, a lot of people, I don't know where to turn. There's so much great boutique amps and stuff. I don't know where to go. I mean, Matty, didn't Matty make you an amp years ago? He's made all sorts of things. I'm, I'm, yeah, sure, I'm sure he, he would, he, the thing is with Matt, he was always telling me, yeah, I've been down in the, he'd be in this dank cellar, you know, making stuff. And I always <laughs> just thought he was nuts. I never really thought that particularly anything, <laughs> anything useful would come out of it. But of course he makes all this genius stuff. And, uh, but me and him. Yeah, are... I mean, he is nuts. But he's so quintess. We talked about him earlier. He's so quintessentially English. He's like that. He's that great eccentric Englishman that we all kind of secretly wish we were. Yeah, I mean, me and him <laughs> bond do. heavily on music. You know, we he he yeah. he loves the old, the Nuggets and the Pebbles albums, all the old surf music, and and of course White Noise. He loved that album, White Noise. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the um, with what's her name from the BBC? Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, um, he introduced me to um, what was what was her name? Stina Norgenstern. Remember oh, that? Right, right. I don't know. It's like this with a whisper. Yeah, yeah. It's like he could always find something that was like him and him and Duke, him and his brother would always just like play me something that eight people in Norway knew about. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it's, it's, I've still got cassettes and cassettes of stuff that he's 
he's made me and I don't know what half of it is <laughs> on there, you know. It, but it's 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 great. And so we bond hugely on that. I, you know, and I and I'm always well chuffed when I play him something and he's never heard it and he loves it. <laughs> uh, I was playing him um, you know, Left Bank, um, um LA band from around the same sort of time as Love and Arthur Lee, sort of sixty six LA. Um, pretty ballerina, walk away, Renee. They and and he'd never heard of them and um and so I was really happy that I'd introduced him to something he'd never heard of. That doesn't happen very often. Well I know I know most Americans don't know the pink fairies, but oh, yeah. most English people don't know Blue Cheer. Blue Cheer is kind of America's version of the Pink Fairies, this kind of underground rock band that influenced all the other rock bands but nobody knows about. Because I came over here and I got uh, a friend of mine played me Blue Cheer, and I was like, cool, who's this? They sound like the Pink Fairies. And he's like, what? You don't know who Blue Cheer are? And I was like, oh, sorry. Yeah, all right, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah. But there's um, The Misunderstood as well. It's another right. incredible band that had an Englishman in them, but basically from um, America. And John Peel used to manage them. John Peel. I didn't know DJ. that. Yeah. Uh, the Misunderstood are an incredible band. One of my favourites. But I loved all that. I yeah, I'll have to try Matty out on that one, see if he, he, he must know stump him. him. He must know the misunderstood. Did you, did, you, did you stump him on that one? I mean, I'll have to try that one out, but I did with um, Left Bank, yeah, so that's that's good. So this, um, so th you should explain this guitar. Do you, do you want to explain the ins and outs? Um, yeah, it's, okay. It's, this is a, you know, I'm not a really a very strat, strats type of person, really. <laughs> Nor, nor am I. It's funny that a lot of my favourite guitar players play strats, but I don't personally like playing them. Yeah, I, I always think that they're the grown-up guitarists. All the, the great guitar players always end up getting older and playing strats. But it sounds, it sounds just like... I was thinking the same thing, Credence. <laughs> um, it sounds very Credence-y. So, uh, so the, I'm not a fan of... Guitars with extra switches and extra knobs on them. I think they, they, you lose the aesthetic appeal of something if you start adding them. But um, we made this guitar for Tim Rennick. And Tim, if you don't know who Tim Rennick is, Tim probably played, he's played on like 600 albums or something. Sure. He, so he started off, talking about Kevin Ayers, but he, he started off um, playing, he was in David Bowie's backing band in 1968 or something. Junior's Eyes, a band called Junior's Eyes. And David borrowed them to be their, his touring band in 1968. And then he went on to play, he's, he's a big session guy, so he played with Eric Clapton and uh, Pink Floyd, and he was Pink Floyd's touring guitarist when Roger left and all those big tours and stuff. Anyway, so, and he loved Strats, and um, he had a guitar stolen that was very much like this, a, hump, a strap with a humbucker in the bridge. So we, we set about sort of recreating it. So it's got a humbucker in the bridge, but um, with this, you can roll off one of the coils rather than click it off like you can with a switch on most guitars, like a coil switcher. You can roll it off, so you go from like a... You get that strap turn. Let's have some... So explain that to me again. So you you just yeah. What happens? So, you turn the volume down. It goes. Yeah. So I, you did, instead of having a coil switch, you roll off. So here's a humbucker. Ah, uh, I see. Can you blend? Just roll it off. But can you can fully blend between yeah. the two? So you can have either. Ooh. Full single coil Ooh, or up to humbucker. I'm looking around the room, I'm getting lots of excitement from the guitar players over there. <laughs> and then it's got the usual stuff where in position two, you split that into single yep. coil. So you get you, you retain that um all that stuff. And right. then the middle switch that no one uses apart from Eric Clapton. Um, and then the same thing there. And then this is a push-push thing which brings the neck pickup in whenever you want. So Ooh, I like that. you can have like, you can, let's say I've got a single coil. You get a Telecaster. Yeah, basically you get a Telecaster. So you got, you got that. Beautiful. So now I've got the single coil. This is a single coil with that one brought in as well. So you, you get that kind of 
wide spacing. <laughs> So, and then you can blend that with, if you put it in position two, you get all three pickups on at once. So, so you got a whole, lot, you know what it's like when you're sat with a guitarist, you're getting some sounds in your recording and you want a slightly different sound, but you don't want to swap guitars and you don't want to, you know, it's nice just to go, okay, well, let's try this one and, you know, and, it, and I love it. I love it. I use this one for, a lot of recording and I very, you know, you find different positions that sound really great. And it's got like, you know, the recessed bolts and stuff, so it's easy to play. And right. this is a Beautiful. particularly flamey bit of, particularly flamey bit of, and it's all um, nice. uh, roasted maple, you know, so the, ma the maple's cooked in an oxygen. Roasted maple? Yeah, it's... it's Sounds um, rather tasty. You could eat it. It's metal, it's great, actually. Um, <laughs> you, you you cook it in an oxygen-free oven, about 100 degrees or something, and it just dries it all out and straightens it all out. It's like um, it's like you've had it for 50 years already. I was about to say, it sounds like it's yeah. aged. Yeah. yeah, and it's kind of... Uh, they resonate really well, and and I again, I, I finish these with oil and wax, like a music, like music Man guitars. I had a Music Man silhouette, special when I was 20 or something. And they had this super slick neck. And I thought, why doesn't everyone do that? Why is that not the industry yeah. standard neck yeah. finish? If you, have a, if you have a lacquer, like an old Fender lacquer, you see Keith Richards and Jeff Beck, their guitar techs have got a big pot of talcum powder. They keep, you know, <laughs> they, that's one of their jobs yeah. is to talc up Keith's neck so he doesn't stick on their way down, you know, playing Start Me Up or whatever. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, and, and a whole load of things. It's, it's yeah. got a few, you know, locking tuners, and the truss rod thing is here with a little wheel, like you know, like a like a. So it's easy to adjust. And, and bare knuckle pickups. Oh my god, bare knuckle pickups. Ah. This guy, I've got a t-shirt. There's a guy in Falmouth <laughs> called Tim Mills in Cornwall, right near where I grew up, and he makes these hand wound pickups. And that Johnny Mars signature ones in his Jaguar, bare knuckle ones, and they make a lot of pickups. They get five star reviews everywhere. Better, they're all hand wound, scatter wound, as they were, they make 52s. Yeah, they're, they're, they yeah, are. They're, there's P90 Nantuckets. Beautiful. Tim Mills makes the best pickups I've ever, ever used. And I've used all of them. Tomas, J.C. Duncan, all of them. And his pickups are astoundingly good. So, yeah, and very, luckily for me now, um, he's put me on the list of like, you know, registered builders, whatever, so I get them at a good price. And, you know, and I, I cannot recommend them enough to anyone. But um, yeah, this this fuzz is good. This I love this fuzz. Well, you, you I get remember the when you were reviewing it, and you you were. Um, I've just put this out for twenty seconds. I'd, I'd never and played put, it before. And you put the juice up, and it was just like, whoa, and you know, you got that sustain with turning into feedback and stuff. It was awesome. Nice 60s. So I just love putting, I, I just, because yeah, as, as Graham was saying, when I reviewed it, I hadn't even plugged it in. So I just kind of put it, plugged it in. And so it's just, it was like, I got so excited when I, I plugged the, yeah. the treble boost and was like, ooh, <laughs> I was like a little kid. <laughs> it is amazing. Yeah, it's, 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 good. it's really simple. Yeah. <laughs> it's great, really meaty, really kind of, again, got a nice velcro -y kind of sound to it. It's pretty much British. Yeah. This is yeah. British, isn't it, really? It's from a dude from Manchester. Yeah, well. <laughs> so it's, it's British. That's what it's saying, BAE, British Audio Enterprises now, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I did not know that. British Audio, not Brent Apple anymore. There's yeah. something, Graham, in, the up. There's something in, in, in the north of the country, all these guys are all from Yorkshire and Manchester. Nice, there's something going on up there. Yeah. Something well, he, he lives in LA now, so he just moved himself to Los Angeles and now brought some Manchester. It's funny because he's so Manchester. When I call him up, he goes, hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's no LA, there's no like, what's up or anything like that. It's just, hello. Yeah. <laughs> hello. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you've got to keep our rhythm. Yes, you do. Graham, listen, I want to hear you through it. Through what? The hot fuzz? Yeah, the hot fuzz, yeah. Wow, all right. Which guitar do you want now? Let's turn that down a little bit. <laughs> oh, ooh, well, this, can, I, can I hear it through the crazy guitar? Because then we can hear the story. Which crazy guitar? The one with the, the Jaguar, oh, is it, or the Jazzmaster? Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, because this is a, this is a six-string bass. So this is oh, it is. I can't see it from. Oh, wow. So this is going to be. Oh, definitely want to hear that. Um, I bought this. I bought this in the late nineties from um, Black Market Music. Oh, I remember Black Market. I love that. I bought a Ricky yeah. bass from there. I got this in there. He said it's it belonged to Sly Stone. And really? But you can see it's got Sly written here. Really? Can I get that close that you may be able to see it? Oh. Um. But I'm, the, I'm not sure whether that is true. You know what? I, it's good enough for me. If it's sliced up, six-string bass, I'm going with it. Oh, six gosh, string it's I'm, a six I'll go with bass. it. Oh, my gosh, what I could do with that. I mean, amazing. And it's got a whammy handle as well, but that's missing at the moment. Um, but, but when I bought it, I was looking at this, the Mad Dog Jazz Burns guitar. You know, those old Burns guitars? Oh, yeah, guitar. yeah. One of those was hanging up, and I said, oh, how much is that? He said, he says, oh, just take that. <laughs> really? Yeah, so he threw it in, which was nice. Which is, which is it's a great guitar. And the reason I've got this is because I just wanted to put it through tons of fuzz pedals, you know, and things like that. But it's funny that. We Strangely got, um, enough, it's an incredibly, um, it's just a brilliant riff maker, really. And it's very interesting on the room there. Dare we turn the fuzz on? Yeah, yeah, just. Oh, yeah. Oh, evil. My trousers are flapping. So cool. Amazing. My neighbour kill me. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's it's. When you come when you come to LA to play next, are you going to bring that with you? I might, I might bring it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to see it on the flesh. My solo stuff. Uh, my friend uh, Lucy, she usually plays this. Um, I've got um, a song where there's a few guitars come in in that sort of meters harmony, each one by one, by, one by one, and it goes on forever. What's it called? Running for Your Life, I think. It's on an album I made called A&E. And so there's a lot of, she sort of plays it on this high R. And um, so we all come in and the harmonies carry on and on and on and on. But I, 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 I'd I, never seen anything like it before. I've, I've seen one since and it's just a normal tortoise shell, sort of um, flamey, sort of, um, what's it called? Sunburst? Sunburst. <laughs> Sort of thing, yeah. And, um, <laughs> but this is this is that got that paint job, and and I don't know the whether it's stuck on. It could be. A, I I believe them. I choose to believe it's belonged to Sly. I mean, I'd like to think. I mean, it's it's in great. It's in great, Nick. And I've I've always just kept it. And it does look. It's been on a few gigs. I never know what to play. And it's just so easy to play mm. that it's just, you know. I'm very envious. It looks absolutely beautiful. Play, play. It's just like, wow. And it's, and it's just... Yes, you have, you have to bring it with you. I will. <laughs> It doesn't feel it. It's weird. I will, and it's just so easy to play. Mm. It's like playing a normal guitar. Yeah. It's got a screw missing from that, so that. Yeah, I was going to say that that means <laughs> we've that got bridge. a bit. <laughs> mastery, those mastery guys, they make that bridge replacement. Oh, they really? make there. They, 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 I use them um, on Graham's guitar. I'll, I'll bring this to show you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, That'd be amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can fix that. The, the, mastery, can the mastery guys. Is that the ones yeah. who made these bridges? There's a, there's a company based in Philadelphia, Mar Minneapolis, and they make these bridges that I use now. 
And they started off by replacing these crappy things. They said, so, you know, if you have a Jaguar, the bridge is rubbish. You know, Pete Townsend told me that what they used to do in the 60s is they got a, um, a Gibson from a Les Paul, you know, not a stock tailpiece, but the, the bit you raise up, the saddles. You can get a saddles from a Les Paul and they fit in a Jaguar. So Peter, ah, right. do that to yours. Much better. But then, oh, right, right. But their mastery actually make, and the, oh, the, yeah. posts, the posts aren't, fl- they, they j- jiggles around. So it's, they're, they're terrible. So mastery make them and they fit perfectly and they've got those saddles. So it's like the string can only be in one place saddled. These guys. Lovely, um... You see that? Anyway, that, that's the, yeah, yeah, they make telecasting. Actually, bridges yeah. Well. But they're the, be- they're the best bridges in the world as well. But yeah, so we'll fix that one day. Hey, couple of quick questions because I'm seeing seeing some stuff in the background. What's the what's the vocal mic you've got there? Ah, Ooh, funny story about that. It's a funny it's story about that. This is the warm, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's a it's a general general purpose warm eighty seven. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about does the job. Day, we, I got two of them because soon I I probably have a drum room because I started life as a well not life I started some sort of, uh, my first thing was hitting drums. You know, I played drums on all my solo stuff and things like that. So I've got a 60, I'm like you, I've got an old, I've got a 1968 Slingerland sort of drum kit, a sort of Lovely. hard bop kit, which is great. So hopefully I'll be able to have that permanently mic'd up somewhere soon. Great. So, um, I've got two of those um, the Warm 87s and they're, they're fantastic. Mm. I think they're brilliant. They'd be great on overheads. Yeah. That's, that's kind of why, I, I mean, I've got all sorts of, of, of of, of, of mics, but that's the one I just sit there because it's sort of um, for just doing vocals and things like that. Because this is sort of where I live. This is where I live, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, this Dave is... Jordan had one of these. He was using them on those records we were talking about. Oh, really? Yeah. Because this um, the light very underrated. Yeah. I know a lot of people liked it. And they, they, they. they... And one of the engineers, Mick, over at uh, Sunset Sound, worked for them when they were designing this. So, okay. what do you use it on? Are you going to use it on drums? I mean, yeah, I could, I could do. I mean, I've got, I've got a sort of a mobile setup here, which is uh, four pre's of Daking, four pre's of Warm API style. Yeah. And, and then um, Audion gave me a ASP eight hundred. Yeah. So there's another eight, and then an Great. API API two five hundred and. So I can just pick that up and take it wherever I... And the Apollo 16. Fantastic. It's got an Apollo 16 in there. Or, or and this is going to go there as well. So this is 10, 10 channels. So, yeah. Are you, are you what DAW are you on? You on Pro Tools or? Well, I've got, I've been, I use Logic a lot, but I've got Pro Tools and I'm just getting, going into all that shenanigans. shenanigans. I think it's kind of um, tricky doing it that way because Pro Tools seems so sort of serious and stern. <laughs> Compared to, <laughs> compared to Logic, which is all happy, you know. <laughs> it's all happy and you can have a picture of your instrument and all of that sort of thing. <laughs> it's all happy. I love that. <laughs> but it is great for just getting sounds down, you yeah, know, yeah. MIDI. Yeah. You know, I've got a little sort of MIDI keyboard and you just... And I was amazed. You know, I'm still learning, of course. I'm only just starting out recording, really. So you put something on a piano and then you can turn it into a mad... I don't know. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, yeah. Tooth saw synth or you know whatever it's called, so you can yep. just try out any sound. Mm-hmm. So I'm having a great time up here at the moment. Having a month fantastic. Month. I see. I should come to London. This sounds more like I'm trying to drag you both over here for the weather. I need to come to London and just sort of. It's well, funny. I, I, one of my good friends is Jamie Hartman. I don't. Do you know Jamie? Who's Jamie yeah, Hart? he wrote. He wrote the. Um, I'm, you know, I'm only human after all. Um, he wrote that with uh, Rag and Bone Man. Oh, I see. I saw him at Stephen's right, place, right. Dragon Moon Man bloke. It's funny because he was over here for, for quite a few years. He's, he's English. He was over here for a while and he, he was doing okay. Um, but then he went back to England and everything just kind of clicked. It's, it's really strange. Somewhere in the world. You know, yeah. the, even in LA, you know, I could walk up the street in some cowboy boots and no one would care. If I did that here, yeah. they'd go, what? <laughs> and you'd get laughed at or stared at, you know. But you yeah. can, you can in, in LA, you can walk up sunset with cowboy boots and a cowboy hat on, you know, and no one would particularly think differently of it. They just think that's a rock dude going up the street. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely eclectic out here. But I like eclectic on a personal level, but I wish there was a, uh, 
don't know what the scene is at the moment. Mm. Will there ever be a scene again? I don't know. Maybe that's not important. I don't know. Maybe, whether, I'm, yeah. maybe I'm harping back to things that aren't important. But I, I love LA. I can't wait to go back. Yeah, well, good. Well, we look forward to, uh, I look forward to seeing you. Next. In sunny Los Angeles, come up into the hang out in this uh, in this room, and then what's that? What's that? Yeah, I know. I, I hear you. What's the amp up there? Oh, this is, is that the, an amp. This is the head for the Victory Sheriff yeah. 22. Oh, nice. Um, oh, I love how small it is. Yeah, it's just. It's it was just so far in the background. That. I thought it was huge. Yeah, <laughs> it's just that. Again, oh, designed great. for aircraft carry carry on. It's even smaller. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, that's fantastic. And the cabinet is just down there facing into all my old overcoats. It's a vertical two by 12. A vertical two by 12, yeah. lovely. Yeah, and that sits, that sits on the top, so width-wise, you know, so it's, it's, it's a tiny stack. They're awesome. Yeah. Is it, is it vintage 30s or It's 25? mismatched. They, Martin Kidd, they did a whole load of testing, a whole bunch of people. I think Guthrie Govan did some testing on it as well, but amongst other people. And they went for, I forgot, what, I've forgotten what they are to be exact, but it's definitely like, that's a vintage 30 and a vintage, and a 75 or something. It's closed back, I think, isn't it, Graham? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, they, I'm digging. purposefully mismatched, but apparently that's the best sound. Oh, nice. So I guess you if you're marking up in a studio, you get two options, you know, you put, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Dave Jordan did that. You were talking about those early 90s records. Dave Jordan, when he did Dirt, he has a, a 412 and he has a vintage 20, was it 25, a 30, a 75, and he had a blue bulldog in there as well, an AC30 blue bulldog. And he would mic all of them and, and then he would choose which one he wanted. Yeah. And that's the sound of like Alice in Chains. He would use right. that. And then, then he also, though, he had those big... Um, Vox Beetle amps, you know, the huge things with the massive, uh, you know, that would be on the, I don't know what you call that, kind of aluminum, aluminium, God, aluminum, been here too long. Aluminum, Warren. Been here too long, I just said aluminum. Oh, like um, an aluminium. Angling it. Yeah, you remember those big things? And they were solid state and built in America, and they just, all they were really was a Vox logo, but everything else is solid stake in American amp. But that's part of the Alice in Chains guitar sound. Because the thing about that solid state is it provides that mid-range solidity. So you'd have like Marshall mixed in with that and blend the two together, you know. It's, but that, you know, that man in a box guitar sound from Facelift, that That's such a great record. Yeah, I don't know that. It's, you should play it to him, Tom. It's just like a wall of guitar. I mean, obviously it's like a, you, you have to hear it through late 80s, early 90s ears, because now that probably is quite achievable by anybody now with yeah. given the technology we have. But I, th I think in that day, I mean, when the first time I ever heard that, I was just like, what is that? You know, how do you do that? You know, blending of all these different amps at the same time, which would be a phase nightmare, an absolute yeah. phase it's nightmare. It's not anymore, just look at the waveform, don't you? I yeah, just, now you look at the waveform. A quick quick. look, flip it over, bosh. It's a lot like, like with a lot of the um, shellac and big black guitar sounds. You know, uh, Steve Albini's kind of stuff. It's just right. like, what is that noise? I, I remember in the 90s going to see them quite a lot at the Underworld, you know, uh, Big Black would play there. Or was it Big Black then? It probably might have been Shellac by then. But anyway, Steve Albini's just <sighs> cra craziness. I was always a big fan of him, his production. I love the very, I love Surfer Rosa, the Pixies album, the best Surfer Rosa. So I loved the, the production on that. It was really, I, yeah, I do it, too. I, I felt like the... The, the skill in what he was doing was the not doing anything. And I'm, I mean that in a supportive way, like yeah. kind of, it always felt like it was, that's what I always liked about Leckie though, John Leckie. You know, when you look at the Stone Roses and the, and the Benz, you know, Stone Roses first and the Benz, they both sound like the bands or yeah. uh, Cooler Shaker's first record. I felt Leckie was always able to not imprint his personality on them. I know he made, makes the bands work hard, like on pre-production, I've always read that, that he worked them hard yeah. before recording. I always thought that was a skill in itself that gets underrated in production is not making it sound like you, yeah, but yeah. capturing the band, you know? I, yeah, just capturing them really well. Oh, have you heard that Rodrigo, Rodrigo Gabriela album he did? John Leckie produced. No, I've got to hear that. You, oh, my God. They Same do, thing? They do, they, they do flamenco-style stuff, heritage stuff, but they do Orion by Metallica. And it's just... <laughs> oh, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, of course do, I have. You know, yeah. you see these, like, you know, violin quartets doing Enter Sandman on YouTube. You know, it's, you know. <laughs> but these guys, those 
Their version of Orion makes my hair stand up on my. On yeah, no, I, I have heard that. Somebody played that to and me. They stare at heaven as well, and it's just isn't it? And it really isn't like oh god, you know. It's they've really brought something to it, and I'm sure John Lucky helped them with that process. We have one band we haven't talked about um, is that could be a huge influence on you, and I don't know if it is XTC. Yeah, I li- I, li- I like XTC. I like bits. Bits of yeah, XTC. Black Sea and English Settlement for me have huge yeah. albums. Oh gosh, it's a, I was I was a big Jam fan, seeing a big Who fan, oh, yeah. a bit of a sort of a. But when when I discovered sort of more hippie stuff, when I, I got really heavily into Cream and Jimi Hendrix and things, and I liked a lot of the hits. I mean, I played some XTC earlier on. Well, well, Blur did a lot of recording with Andy Partridge, and a lot of it was shelved. Um, really? Yeah, but there there is a box set, and I think it's all on. <laughs> There's a box set that I put together with the group. I had shoe boxes full of old rehearsals and funny old stuff still on cassette, which we just put all onto a box set. And Andy Partridge versions of some stuff, but he 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 showed me. Um, but I bought. I think I I bought Sergeant Rock is going to help me, and I loved Generals and yep. Majors and, and Generals and, and, that and stuff. Majors. Yeah. And... That's a great sound. Yeah. But, but, but I'm, I, I talked to him about Sergeant Rock because I thought the chords, the chords in that are just are crazy. But they're, they're actually lovely chords, and the Sergeant Rock is going to help me chorus bit. Is this? <laughs> Beautiful. Such nice chord, but with, a, with that sort of jump, jump, short with a bit of gain on it. It's, um, but I always loved the production, the production on it. And he was, um, I don't know. I mean, the, the stuff we did with him was 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 brilliant, but it wasn't quite what we were after at that time. I, I I've got to hear that. So that's that is available on a box set. Yeah, yeah. But he was an amazing. But I, I, I've never laughed so much with anybody in a social <laughs> situation. <laughs> Absolutely, insanely funny. And wait, isn't he from Swansea? Isn't he? Swindon. Swindon Why did I yeah, say Swansea? Swindon. I don't know why I said Swansea. Too many SWs. I've been here too long. Been in America too long. I'm He's mixing up my, Sw- my country. Swindon, yeah. He's from Swanage. Swanage, yeah. Swanage, Swindon, Swansea. <laughs> it's all rather fun. I mean, I'm blessed to be able to do this. It's brilliant. Pretty... I think I've probably seen all every one of your, your, your videos. It's been I really... need to have you as an endorser on my site. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been inspiring to me because there's a few things in here. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the 1073, the BAE 1073 here, which I got, which I first started looking at and learned about because of you That's looking amazing. at one and you have one sort of sitting under your monitor there all the time. And, um, I do, so, apparently, so yeah. I, 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 got, I got that, among other things, you know, the, some, a couple of the Lewitt mics I got because the one with the valve in it, Oh yeah, nine forty. Yeah, and um, because because it's a bit of a strange world, and I think people like you make it a little bit easier to navigate. Where it's just a sort of right. I've got this. We're going to use it. We're going to record a whole electric guitar, Mm. use bass, acoustic guitar, and a vocal all today. Do it all on this, and um, it makes the world a bit easier. Like you know, when I was fifteen, I had to buy songbooks to learn with chord boxes and things like that. Now, of course, you know you can go onto YouTube and learn all sorts of stuff. And so, yeah, you. You've taught me lots of stuff. You definitely inspired. You've definitely inspired me on recording. You are rather very both drums. rather generous. Recording drums. I like your like. Um, I never would have put two condenser mics pointing at the floor. You know, t- an inch from the floor for a drum kit. It never would have occurred to me ever occurred to do that until I saw you doing it. I can't remember who I stole that from. I have you seen the. Uh, you guys, have, I, have you seen the symbol mic I do? I put the symbol mic and I mic the symbol. What, from below? Or? No, I put a symbol on the ground in oh, front of a drum kit. Right. Oh, right. And I mic that. Allegedly, I was told that's a John Leckie trick. I'd like to interview him and ask him. I know he's not really one for interview. In fact, one of the things I admire about John Leckie is a little bit of... Uh, and now you've just worked with him. I, I, I worked with... Uh, I'm not going to say who the band was, but I worked with a very well-known band a few years ago. And they asked me, well, you know, if I wasn't working with you, Warren, you know, who would you suggest? And I was like, the only producer really for me that, 
you know, would stand, you know, has done so many different genres, you know, starting with what? He was an engineer on All Things Must Pass. You know, I mean, he, you know, he's worked with George Harrison. He was an engineer at Abbey Road in the late 60s working on Beatles records. So to me, I was like, this is the guy you need to work with. So they asked him and they were huge and they'd sold millions of records. They asked him and he said, no. <laughs> and I remember, I remember thinking to myself, he just went up in, it, 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 you know, my estimation even more because at that point it was only a, five or six years ago, he didn't have any massive albums, and this would have been a half million dollar paycheck or something like that, you know, and he just said no. And I remember thinking to myself, I like this guy. <laughs> yeah, he does seem to just... Yeah. It's not about the money, you know. I, no, no, you know, it doesn't seem to be like that at all with him, because my, my connection with him recently, he was, it was for absolutely nothing. You know, no money involved for anybody, you know, it was... For the love of it. <laughs> so, yeah, for the laugh so, and the love. So there you go. And, and microphones is, is probably, I don't know why, but it is the one area where I get a bit, really, that much money? I mean, I could, if, it's, yeah. if it's a metal thing that you screw into a rack, I don't seem to have so much of a problem. It's weird, but microphones, it's, I mean, I, cer I certainly aren't, I'm not a very geekish person in that way that I have to find an, an, yeah. ancient, an ancient I think for me, it's, I was having a U87 discussion underneath one of my videos the other day. And I completely understand that now microphones with Slate's microphones and with, you know, the warm, that there's probably so many things that are really, really close. I think the only, the number one reason to buy a Neumann U87 would be based on this one piece of information only, that I can go to Sunset Sound and pull out a pair of 87s that they bought in 1970 or whatever that are still working and have probably never been repaired. So if it's just, if you're like a commercial studio or you've got so much traffic and you're moving it around and you know you're gonna keep it for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I think that's where the 2,000, 3,000 pounds, dollars, whatever makes sense because it's the build quality is like, you know, it's like why buy a Mercedes when you can buy a Mazda? Well, if you're only gonna keep your car for three or four years, then buy the Mazda, yeah, yeah. but if you're gonna, keep something for 30 or 40 years, that's where probably the Mercedes makes the sen makes sense, you know. I, maybe I'm wrong, but no, I think yeah. that's probably the only difference. But if you're like us and you're changing gear and you want to try stuff out, that's where I think, like, you're like, why do I have to spend... Like, I don't sell guitars, yeah. so I buy a guitar that's going to last me forever because I'm never going to sell it. But I, I, mean, I Yeah, I don't feel, know. I I'm speculating. Feel, I kind of feel a guilt. I feel a guilt, really. About, about Say again? I feel a sort of guilt spending that much money on yeah on a on a microphone. I feel like I mean I don't know. And then and then there's the thing of uh, line up ten of eighty sevens and they all sound they're all sound yeah. different anyway. I mean it's just it's a kind of a lottery anyway. I wouldn't know what I was buying. You know I don't know whether I've ever been in a control room and heard someone singing into the best U eighty seven in the whole world. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> You know, it's a microphone. <laughs> no, I completely understand. All right, well, thanks very much. That, you know, I, I, I want to do another one of these. I, we've just got to find another excuse. When are you, uh, when are you both going to be in sunny Los Angeles? Los Angeles. I want to get over there at some point to get rid of this uh, weather out. Get, get this weather out. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I love coming to LA. I came mm -hmm. last year to visit friends and to Zoom about. So hopefully in the next two or three months, I'd like to get out to... To, to Lovely. Can you I, drag this fellow out as well? I've got a few people to see. There's a few people in Los Angeles. A guy called Jim Ebden. Do you know Jim Ebden? He's a live sound engineer. Does, he's done the live sound for tongues. He does Maroon 5 sound now. He did like Simply Red and Wet, Wet, Wet and loads of huge... He is, he's, he's out there now. He was dad's old engineer. So he, he's going to Oh, I'd him. love to talk to him because I don't get... I've tried to ask a couple of live sound ones. Particularly Matty, who doesn't want to do it. Get Jim. Jim is. <laughs> oh, Matt. Jim is. He's worked with everyone. Jim is amazing. He was. He was. I'd love to talk because that, that that's a completely ignored subject. Yeah. Jim Ebden. E B D O N. Oh, get, let me get his info from you. Yeah. If that's okay. He's a lovely guy too. That, that would be marvelous. He's I, a bit yeah, I think that's a much, kid. <laughs> much maligned, ignored area of what we do. And uh, I, I will see... say, when I saw you at Hollywood Bowl, what was it last year? Early last year? Two thousand fifteen, I think. Was it 2015? At the end of the year, yeah, yes. Yeah, it was life is moving fast. Uh, yeah. 
I will say, and it's not just because he's our mutual friend, but uh, that's the best sound I'd ever heard at Hollywood Bowl. That's and Matt, I mean, he Matt is. got his seats, you know, like just in front of, you know, in one of the boxes in front of the um, the soundboard. And my wife was like, oh no, I forgot earplugs because she was so worried because we were so close to the stage. And I was like, no, this isn't going to be your usual like rock concert where it's square waves pumping out, blowing out your ears. I mean, it was loud, but it was crystal clear. Yeah. And... Uh, he That's is amazing. He is amazing. He works very hard, and he has. He is mad, and you know, um, in a beautiful way. He, he's one of my yeah. favourite people on the planet, and uh, he he's great. And he is. He is incredibly clever. You know. In so I think it would make a great discussion, yeah. Tom, to talk to, you know, one of these guys at this yeah. level because it's a really kind of ignored thing. And yeah. Because I remember. Like, Graham, when you went to Insanity and you're tra- taking pedals, the fact I could actually hear the difference in the pedals, that might sound silly, but most of the time when I'm working with bands in pre-production, they're all worried about their live thing and how am I going to reproduce it. I usually say to them, you only really need three or four sounds live because the subtleties are lost yeah. in the live show. And that's true in 99% of situations. Mm. But when you get a great sound, man, you can hear the subtlety. Yeah. And you can hear the difference in the pedals. As opposed to like distortion, clean, somewhere in between. <laughs> yeah, and it's always ongoing. He's always, you know, this microphone. We discovered this this brilliant the Delta microphone that we were that we were using. Um, oh, I have one in there, the Sontronics. Yeah, the Sontronics yeah. That was yeah. on the front of my cab, along with everything else. And um, yeah, the use of pedals pedals live is is, is another whole subject and three stages of distortion, and then. You know, because my pedal yep. board is is, is 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 pretty crazy, and to be smooth and to trans get, get from one to the other in a smooth, nice way, um, that's another tap dancing skill altogether. Isn't it? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks ever so much for your time, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. It's been great. Yeah. Thanks it's for the lesson on the pedals and the guitars and everything. I'm sure Warren, we can come to some kind of arrangement at some point. I'm I'm very happy to hear that. I'm sure we can sort something out at some point. I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you ever so much for your time. Have a marvellous time recording and mixing. I want to hear some of your solo stuff. I really want to hear that stuff with John Leckie. Oh, right. Just one song that was. Interesting. Lovely. But, yeah, it'll be be out and about soon. I'll let you know what it is in in private. And I'm going to get hold of the box set now so I can hear the Andy Partridge stuff. Yeah, yeah, interesting. It's very interesting. Well, thank you ever so much. Have a marvellous time recording and mixing, everyone. Yeah. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. I'll try and get them to answer something. Please leave comments below. Yeah. Questions very weird below. Side of the, the, it the is very As ever, subscribe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hit the subscribe. <laughs> yeah. See, he said it. Thank you ever so much. See you, man. Cheers.